Good afternoon, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us today and welcome to our latest Here from the Experts webinar. This series is helping people better understand multiple sclerosis, highlights MS-related resources, plus we hope to provide tools and tips to navigate your MS journey with more knowledge and confidence. Our intention is to help you learn more about the disease, treatments, research, wellness strategies, our programs, and much, much more. My name is Gabrielle Vito, and it's a real privilege for me to be moderating today's session. I am a longtime volunteer with the MS Society of Canada since my own diagnosis back in 1996. I have relapsing remitting MS with the onset of fatigue, and I'm coming to you today from the beautiful community of Parksville on Vancouver Island in, Van in British Columbia, Canada. Now, before we get into today's presentation, let's briefly go over a couple of housekeeping items. Your microphones have been muted and will remain muted for the entirety of today's broadcast. This session is being recorded and will be available soon on our website in English. We're also adding French subtitles into the recording, but that version won't be available for several weeks. The recordings will be available on the MS Society website under Nationwide Webinars from the archived page and of course on our YouTube channel. Now, if you have questions for today's expert, please type them into the chat box on the right-hand side of your screen and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible following today's formal presentation. And we have received some pre-submitted questions as well to help get us started. This session is also being broadcast today on Facebook Live and we welcome that audience to also type in any questions you have again into the chat box. Please note that questions pertaining to specific personal situations likely cannot be answered in this type of a venue and we recommend contacting your personal MS healthcare team or perhaps contacting the MS Knowledge Network for those specific questions to your situation. Now speaking of the MS Knowledge Network, we have staff including an MS Navigator monitoring the chats and they will be sharing additional information when and if appropriate. Also, please note that the MS Society of Canada, as always, does not approve, endorse, or recommend any specific product, therapy, or service, but provides information to assist individuals in making their own health and wellness decisions. Today's broadcast is an opportunity to learn more about dietary choices and how they can affect those with MS and wellness strategies. We're very grateful to Roche Canada for providing sponsorship to make this webinar possible. We also want to acknowledge that we've received financial support from two fundraising events, the Night to Fight MS and FU MS. Now, our expert today is Dr. Terry Walls, the creator of the Walls Diet. She's an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of Iowa, where she conducts clinical trials in the setting of multiple sclerosis. In 2018, she was awarded the Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her contributions to research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. Dr. Walls, as many of you will know, has secondary progressive MS and was able to restore her own health using that diet and lifestyle program that helped her transition from being confined to a tilt recline wheelchair for four years to now pedaling her bike to work each day. She'll tell us more about diet options for people with MS and how to eat healthier to improve your wellness. Welcome, Dr. Walls. Thank you so much for being here. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, here are my disclosures, uh, and uh, I have funding from the National Emma Society, and we'll talk about that research. My uh, first research was funded uh, by the direct uh, uh, MS charity out of Canada. I've trademarked the Walls Diet Plans, the Walls Protocol. I've published a number of books, and I've been paid to speak and have equity interest in those companies. Uh, now, the university has the conflict of interest plan, and I want you to know that an independent statistician uh, conducts the statistical analyses uh, for all of my studies, and that statistician is masked to diet assignment. Uh, they prepare a final report uh, and review the conclusions. Uh, that way you can be confident that the uh, data that I present to you um, uh, is unbiased. And um, the clicker seems to have lost the connection. Um, so I may need to have you guys main. Okay, maybe we're back. Okay, so we're gonna talk about my story. 
Um, we'll talk about research from my lab. Uh, I'll give you some recommendations for improving health. Uh, and now before I became a physician, I uh, was a athlete. I competed in full contact Taekwondo. In 1978, I was a bronze medalist for the Pan American Trials uh, in Washington, DC. I entered medical school, uh, completed uh, my medical training, residency, was in private practice, had a couple of kids, and I thought everything was going great. And then in 2000, I became a patient. Uh, I developed left leg weakness. I had a uh, prior history of visual dimming 13 years earlier. Uh, I had lesions in my spinal cord, in my brain. I had abnormal spinal fluid consistent with MS. And so I'm diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS. I seek out the best MS center here in the United States. I see the uh, best people. I take the newest drugs. Uh, and um, interestingly enough, in 2002, my neurologist told me about the direct MS, which is a Canadian group, which induced, introduced me to the work of Lauren Cardain, which introduced me to the paleo diet. So after 20 years of being a vegetarian, I adopt the paleo diet. I give up all grains, legumes, and dairy. And the next year, I need a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, I've converted to secondary progressive MS. I take mitoxantra in a form of chemotherapy. I continue to decline. I'm then switched to Tizabri. I continue to decline. And then I'm switched to uh, uh, Salcept. Uh, by 2007, I'm so weak, I cannot sit up in a regular chair. I have a zero gravity chair, one like this uh, at home. Uh, and one like this in my office at work. Now, fortunately, I don't have any cognitive decline, so I'm still staffing residents um, who see the patients, tell me about them. I'm also uh, going to the Institutional Review Board uh, and uh, supervising uh, clinical research. I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I take their course in neuroprotection. Um, I have a longer list of supplements, because I've been reading the basic science and I've decided that mitochondria are key. Uh, and I have this list of supplements. I take uh, the IFM course. I have a longer list of supplements. I discover electrical stimulation of muscles. I convinced my physical therapist to let me have a test session. Uh, and after a year of uh, this targeted supplements, a paleo diet, electrical stimulation of muscles. I'm up walking again. And in fact, I'm able to do an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. Uh, and you know, this really changes how I think about disease and health. My uh, chair of medicine at the university calls me in, asks me to uh, get a case report written up and then a case series. Uh, and then he wants me to begin doing a safety and feasibility study. Uh, and he gets me the mentors uh, and that's, what we begin doing. Uh, and so again, we're using the paleo diet, electrical stimulation of muscles, targeted supplements uh, in people with secondary and primary progressive uh, MS. It's a single arm. Uh, we have blinded assessors. And the questions we ask are, can other people do what I did? Uh, was it safe? Uh, and what is the effect size on fatigue, quality of life, walking function, hand function, mood, um, anxiety, depression, thinking, uh, and blood lipids. And uh, uh, the diet, uh, we'll go over that a bit more. Uh, it's lots of vegetables. Uh, we encourage liver once a week, uh, wild fish, grass-fed meat, according to what people can afford. Uh, we teach them meditation, exercise, and we uh, show them how to do electrical stimulation of muscles. Uh, and this is an example of the meals, uh, big salads. Those are some lamb chops, uh, cooked greens, Brussels sprouts, uh, and elderberry smoothie. I had to do a uh, assessment of my diet since this was such a, a radical diet. Uh, and the dietitian who analyzed the 24-hour uh, recall of three days of my diet uh, said that this was the most nutrient-dense diet that she'd ever analyzed in her 35 years of uh, dietary research. Um, so we're able to show that the big risk was if you're overweight, um, you lost weight without being hungry. One had to withdraw at six months due to continued cognitive decline. And that is an anticipated 
consequence of having progressive uh, MS. Uh, what I'm showing you here is that uh, people radically changed their diet. Uh, they were having very few vegetables, typical of the standard American diet. They went up to more than eight servings uh, per day. They eliminated gluten, dairy, and eggs. They added electrical stimulation of muscles and exercise, kept it up. The top two lines uh, show that the quality of life, uh, the energy and general health scores uh, improved uh, 14 to 17 points. And a five point change is clinically meaningful. The bottom line is a reduction in fatigue severity, a lower number is better. Uh, and it reduced by 2.38 points and a change of 0.45 points is clinically meaningful. Uh, this shows the uh, adherence to the interventions that people radically uh, improve their diet. Uh, they avoided the harmful foods. They radically uh, improve their exercise and their e-stim. Uh, again, if you were overweight, uh, you lost weight. Seem to be having, uh, here we go. Uh, so lipids improved, the body mass index went down, total cholesterol went down, uh, uh, triglycerides went down, the good cholesterol improved, and the HDL triglyceride ratio went down, which is favorable. That means insulin sensitivity uh, improved. Uh, anxiety and depression scores declined, the verbal and spatial reasoning uh, improved. Uh, and the more vegetables you ate, the more of the harm, the gluten, dairy, and eggs that you avoided, the better the impact was uh, on mood, uh, verbal reasoning, and reduction fatigue. Uh, and that's a picture of my cousin, my dad in the background, and my uh, horse, my Appaloosa horse. Okay, then we are funded by the MS Society to conduct a clinical trial comparing the low-fat swank diet versus the modified paleo elimination diet, uh, which is uh, the six to nine servings of vegetables and berries. We took out grains, took out nightshades, took out dairy, took out eggs, uh, asked people to reduce and eliminate uh, added sugars. The low saturated fat diet, uh, reduced fat uh, to less than 15 grams of saturated fat per day. So it's a lot of uh, poultry, white fish, uh, and four servings of grain, preferably whole grains uh, every day. We had people come in, uh, get baseline assessments. We had them continue their usual diet. They repeat, returned in 12 weeks, repeated the assessments. That let us verify that the uh, measures were stable. Then they were randomized to get either the Wallace diet or the Swank diet. They came back at 12 weeks to repeat the assessments. And then uh, they could gradually reintroduce the nightshades. Uh, and then they'd come back in another 12 weeks and have repeat assessments. Okay. Uh, and this is just to let you know that we uh, did a control for these clinically meaningful control variables. And that statistically, the two groups were the same. Now, our primary outcome was, would fatigue severity score be more significantly reduced in the Walls group than the Swank group? And uh, it was not. It was statistically equivalent between Walls and Swank at both 12 and 24 weeks. And what is notable is that fatigue was reduced. Uh, so the red line is the clinically significant uh, area of reduction. Uh, and so both diets had clinically meaningful significant reductions in fatigue. Then if we look at the modified fatigue impact scale, which is, has a more significant, uh, a more sensitive look at fatigue, the Walls group, uh, ha which is the gold bar, is more significantly reduced than the Swank group, which is the uh, black bar. Uh, but again, both groups have reduced fatigue. The quality of life, uh, there's a physical health quality of life and a mental health quality of life. Uh, again, both groups have clinically meaningful improvement in quality of life with the Walls group having uh, statistically and clinically uh, greater levels of improvement than the Swank group.
Okay. What? Let's see if we, there we go. Okay. Now, the mental health quality of life. The uh, Swank group improves slightly, but it's not clinically significant at 12 weeks. Uh, the Walls group um, clinically and statistically significantly improved. Uh, both Swank and Walls are significantly improved at 24 weeks. Again, Walls more so than the Swank group. The six minute walk test, which is uh, how far you can walk in six minutes, they are, neither group improves uh, appreciably at 12 weeks. And that's not surprising because we did not, we specifically asked people to not add an exercise program because this is a diet study. If their physicians referred them for exercise, uh, that was fine. At 24 weeks, what is interesting is that the Walls group had clinically meaningful gains in their walking endurance. Uh, and that's statistically and clinically significant. And it's a trend different than SWANK. The p-value is 0 0.08, so not statistically different, uh, but we would call that a trend. Symbol digit modalities test is a look at working memory. Uh, and you think of it as a RAM in your computer. Interesting, the SWANK group does better than the WALLS group at 12 weeks. At 24 weeks, um, they are equivalent. Okay, so how do we make this more affordable? I, I think the message I want everyone to hear is that the standard American diet, probably the standard Canadian diet, uh, does not lead to improved fatigue, uh, uh, improved quality of life, or improved uh, walking uh, or um, uh, working memory. Adopting either the Swank diet or the Walls diet is beneficial. Uh, uh, the Walls diet being more beneficial than Swank in some, but not all of the measures. How do we make this more affordable? 20 to 40% of all the food, the groceries that we buy are thrown out. Uh, and so learning how to shop, meal plan, and plan for your leftovers so that you are eating all the food that you buy is a really great first step. Learning how to cook. Uh, many people have forgotten or never learned how to cook in meal plan. Uh, so cook using recipes. Um, I, I've got an example of my cookbook there. Uh, and I wrote that assuming that people don't know how to cook, that they are exhausted, and that we wanna have sort of a template so you can begin making uh, your uh, recipes. You can have vegetarian options with beans and rice, particularly uh, cooked using a pressure cooker can make it uh, helpful. A hunt, fish, garden make will make it more affordable. Meal plan for the week by identifying your protein uh, and vegetables. And then grocery shop, uh, uh, again, going around uh, the periphery of the grocery store uh, so you can get your meat, your vegetables, use frozen vegetables, uh, that, again, that will make this much, much more affordable. Sit to top your vegetables. Um, uh, I think that it's one of the most uh, important things you can do is to bring your, your food over to your counter and sit down or to your kitchen table and sit down uh, and chop your vegetables. Uh, you could use a food processor, batch cook, uh, freeze your leftovers, plan for leftovers that will make uh, this vastly more affordable. I also like to have one pot meals where we have a uh, protein that we perhaps cook in the skillet and then add the chopped vegetables for the last two minutes. And I may have a sauce that I add afterwards, for example, uh, olive oil blended with my favorite garden herbs uh, to make a sauce that I pour over everything that I just cooked, uh, a slow cooker meal, uh, a uh, soup or a stew in a slow cooker, uh, taking a cooking class with your local, um, uh, here uh, in the States, uh, we have community colleges. I'm not sure what the equivalent is in Canada, uh, but to look for a local cooking class so you can get more comfortable with learning how, how to cook. And ideally cook using recipes as opposed to cook using a box of already prepared food. 
And I want you to know everything is connected to everything else. The biochemistry of life is richly interconnected, which is why it is so critical that you understand the food you eat will affect your microbiome, which will affect your immune cells, which will affect the level of inflammation in your body and in your spinal cord, cranial nerves, uh, and your brain. So the more we can address the system, the mm -hmm. better chance you'll have at quieting disease activity. We spent a lot of time talking about food, and I'll, and I'll be thrilled to answer questions for you. Um, but the more you can address your environment, uh, reduce your exposure to synthetic chemicals, improve your sleep, improve your movement, add stress reduction, improve your sense of safety, the more effective you'll be at improving how your cells run the chemistry of life. Changing dietary patterns is really hard. Um, food scientists uh, are being picked up by uh, big food, big industry, that uh, they're hire hiring the food scientists to design foods that taste really great, that stimulate our pleasure centers, that create craving if we don't consume them. So those donuts are very tasty. They stimulate a lot of dopamine release, uh, a lot of pleasure, and you'll have craving. The gluten in those donuts stimulate the opioid receptors, the pleasure centers, and will create craving. Likewise, the, the casein in dairy stimulate the opioid receptors, stimulate pleasure, and will create craving if you're not consuming them. So changing your dietary patterns is hard. Sugar, processed foods is addicting. Gluten is addicting. That's why the grains are, are so addicting. Dairy is also addicting for that reason. And technology, you know, the smartphones that we all uh, hang on to and are using all the time uh, are addicting. We have uh, uh, children that are addicted to smartphones under the age of five. Um, we have uh, teenagers that are addicted. We have uh, our young students uh, in junior high, high school and college that are um, dropping out of their scholastic activities because of their uh, gaming addictions. In my clinical practice, I talk to my uh, patients about why they wanna do this change. In our clinical trials, we talk to our study participants about what is their why? What would they do if their health could moderately improve? And for me, in my health journey, it was uh, my two very young children. At the time that I was diagnosed, uh, my son was eight and my daughter was five. And I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair when my son is 11 and my daughter is eight. So I was thinking a lot about those kids. My father died when I, um, uh, in let's see, 92. Uh, uh, and in 95, we started planting our cornfields and hay fields over into trees. Uh, and uh, this is a field that we planted walnuts uh, and oak trees. Uh, and that's a picture of our soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, our, our dog with us at that time. And 20 years later, and I, I, I'm going to go back for a moment. I think maybe I can go back. Yeah. So the first few years as the trees are coming up, um, the broadleaf weeds are obscuring the trees. And I'm like, I can't believe we spent all this money and where are the trees? Like, oh my God, we, you know, this is really terrible. I, and my brothers and I were, were very upset uh, and very concerned about uh, what we had done. At about five years, the trees overtake uh, the weeds and now they begin shading out the weeds. And now 20 years later, the understory has come in. We have Jack in the Palma, we have ferns. Uh, and uh, the forest floor is really much darker. Uh, and the forest has emerged. The reason I, I, I'm showing you this 
is that I, I don't want you to underestimate the power of your daily habits. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to show you uh, this video. Yeah, I, I, so I'm not able to show the video. So if you go to terrywalls.com forward slash research papers, uh, you can get copies of our papers and we'll have, uh, we have links uh, to the research video. The, the video is remarkable in that the subject three has secondary progressive MS. It will take her a hundred and, oh, maybe we are gonna get to see the video. So watch her stand. It's, we're worried about her ability to walk. We're gonna chase her with a chair because it's such a struggle for her to walk. It, if you watch her feet, she's dragging her feet across the bottom of the carpet. She really has a hard time flexing her ankle up. Uh, and again, it'll take her 127 seconds to stand, walk eight feet, turn around uh, and uh, come back to the chair and sit down. Now, again, she's doing uh, the wall's elimination diet, uh, targeted supplements, electrical stimulation. At nine months is the first time we can see a change in her walking, see how much more smoothly she stands, how much more readily she can pull her legs forward, how much easier it is for her to, to lift her toes up. So she still needs her walker. That took her 45 seconds. Subject 11 has a cane for short distances a walker for long distances. At three months, she's improved enough that she can walk in Birkenstocks. At six months, she is able to jog for the first time in years and her fatigue is completely resolved. Subject 14 is very stiff. He has two walking sticks that he needs to walk with. Uh, and again, at nine months is when we first see his improvement. He's much less stiff, he's much more fluid. And you'll see him uh, coming back that he's able to, he's faster and more fluid without uh, walking sticks. And then subject 17 has primary progressive MS, two walking sticks, very stiff, very spastic. At three months, we can see improvement. She's faster with one walking stick. And she's also faster without any walking sticks. And her fatigue, which was quite severe, is also entirely resolved. Okay, so we do have a new study uh, and we have um, survey-based studies uh, that you can learn more at walls.lab.uiowa.edu forward slash join hyphen study. Uh, we have a one-page handout, uh, terrywalls.com forward slash diet. There's a wonderful documentary about my healing uh, journey. Uh, the other study that, and I think I have another slide. Well, I will tell you about uh, my other slide. Um, the other study that we have, efficacy of diet and quality of life. Um, this is a study that compares a ketogenic diet a, uh, the modified paleo diet and usual diet. People uh, come to Iowa at baseline at three months and at 24 months. We get a MRI at the beginning and at the end without contrast um, so that we can see um, changes in brain structure, changes in brain volume, and we'll measure changes in walking, uh, in vision, hand function, and working memory, quality of life. We've got 50 people in the study now. Our goal is to have 156. Anticipate that I'll be recruiting for another um, uh, probably 15 months before we get all 156. We are, we do, we have had a couple folks come in from Canada. So um, yes, you, you, you can come uh, if you're from Canada. Um, we have a, a small amount of money for some travel, but the only travel dollars are for up to 500 miles worth. So it certainly would not cover all of the travel related costs uh, coming from Canada. 
I invite you to follow me on Instagram. You get to see what I'm eating, uh, get some uh, health and wellness tips. Follow me on uh, Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, and we have a... Um, uh, a new um, session coming up tomorrow uh, and Saturday that is talking about remyelination. Uh, and I believe your host will be uh, sending a link for that. So if people want to register for that, um, and we have a variety of programs to help people implement these concepts. I'm also uh, capable of seeing patients. We have a limited private practice as well. Uh, and with that, that concludes my remarks because I had said I would get everything done within 30 minutes. So we'd have plenty of time for questions, Gabriel. Fabulous. Dr. Walls, thank you so much for that really informative presentation. And you're right, we do have lots of questions. So Good. your instincts are bang on. So I'm gonna start right away from uh, questions coming in on the Facebook Live. Let's go with, first of all, dairy. For no dairy, does that include things that are lactose free as well? So lactose is sugar, casein is protein. So I, I recommend people take dairy out because the protein casein is structurally very similar to the protein gluten. And if you have a abnormal immune response to gluten, you will also have an abnormal re immune response to casein. And if you've been having gluten and casein all of your life, you have no idea how much better you could feel if you would take those foods out. In my clinical practice, um, I ask people to take them out for three months and then uh, reassess if they want to bring them in. In my clinical trials, the um, undergraduate students would come work in our lab. I would ask, invite them to follow our study diet for a month, for a week, just so they could see what we were asking our patients to do. And so these college students, you know, in the peak of their lives are taking gluten and dairy out. Uh, I, would, I wasn't worried so, so much about eggs and they're eating all these vegetables. And so that first week they're having a lot of withdrawal and craving and they feel miserable. And so at the end of the week, I can't wait to have my pizza and beer. And they go back to their pizza and beer and now they feel miserable again because now they had you know gotten rid of all that inflammation and craving. They would have just been getting past their withdrawal and their craving, they reintroduce the gluten and dairy, and now they have headaches and they're feeling bad. And they come back and say, you know what? I think I want to go back to your the study diet. And people discovered that their anxiety reduced, their concentration improved, uh, uh, severe menstrual cramps reduced. Um, uh, 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 some folks had their siblings uh, have some major health improvements as well. So fascinating. Uh, that, that, that neat story that you got students involved as well. Uh, now, with our next question is about uh, help with pain and sleep. Does this diet help with pain or sleep at all? So there's a lot of great evidence that uh, diet is closely linked to sleep. Um, so yes, improving diet can be very helpful uh, uh, for sleep. Uh, and of course, there, there are more things that I suggest uh, about sleep, uh, getting outside, getting uh, into uh, daylight, uh, particularly if you can do it within a couple hours of, sun, of sunrise, that would be very helpful. Getting rid of sugar, reducing um, alcohol in the evening, uh, eating uh, at least two hours, preferably three hours before you go to bed, uh, 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 that would be very helpful. Um, but we certainly have in our clinical trials found that sleep quality and quantity improves as people implement the diet. In my clinics at the VA, uh, where um, we created a therapeutic lifestyle clinic um, because I had such success uh, with my plans in my traumatic brain injury clinic and then primary care, that people who had severe pain and fatigue, as we put them basically uh, on the Walls diet, they would come back and we'd see them every uh, four weeks. Within four weeks, people would often say, my pain is reducing for the first time. Uh, and their uh, medication use, their narcotic use is going down. Uh, and uh, again, that pain would further reduce the longer people were on the diet. So I'd be absolutely very optimistic. Now, our next question has to do specifically with beans and lentils. 
uh, the person is asking for some people, these could be considered inflammatory. Is this also yeah. true with some who may have MS? So um, what we're talking about are the lectins that are in nightshades, uh, in grains uh, and the legumes. Uh, and so, yes, uh, the more anti-inflammatory diet would take out nightshades, uh, beans and legumes. That's a much more restrictive diet. Um, so that if we remove that, I do that only on a temporary basis. I also am mindful that if people are vegetarian, beans uh, and uh, gluten-free grains are be an important part of their protein source. Those people I have prepare the legumes in grains using a pressure cooker. Okay, and what about soy, Dr. Walls? So soy is a legume. Uh, the advantage that soy has, it's a complete protein. Uh, and so uh, if you're vegetarian, that can be a very helpful source uh, of protein. However, it can have lectins in it. And if lectins are a problem for you, uh, they can be inflammatory. Um, so again, if you're having soy, if you put it through a pressure cooker, um, uh, that reduces the lectins. Uh, again, that's sort of an individualized um, assessment, whether I have to be concerned about that. Right. And now you did mention uh, in your presentation about reducing alcohol. And the next question is, are we allowed to drink wine? Well, you know, it's, it's, a very, it's a great question. When we look at the observational data on alcohol, uh, there's something called a J curve, that the lowest all-cause mortality is if uh, you have alcohol a limited amount uh, a couple days a week. So for women, that might be a glass of alcohol uh, uh, one or two days a week. Um, uh, for, if you have alcohol every day, the risk goes up. If you binge alcohol, the risk goes up a higher. If you have zero alcohol, the risk is you know about equivalent to having uh, uh, one drink, uh, uh, one glass of wine every day. So m my advice is the best is probably to have uh, one glass of wine twice a week. Um, if it's, it's fine to have no alcohol. Um, what I think is harmful is having binge alcohol or having more than one drink a day. Excellent advice. Now, our next question is talking about saturated fats and eggs. They're wondering specifically about coconut oil. Is that too high in saturated fat? And what about eggs? Okay. So <clears throat> for some people, coconut oil uh, can lead to increases in cholesterol, but it's, it's not for everyone. So if, if you're going to, and I think coconut oil, coconut milk is quite delicious. Um, I, I do cook with that. It's really quite lovely. If you're going to have a regular consumption of coconut milk, coconut oil, uh, I certainly would want you to follow your lipids. The, a high intake, uh, in, you know, the question is, what is the optimal cholesterol value? The heart cardiologist will tell you, you want your cholesterol less than 200. However, if you're looking at all-cause mortality, uh, the lowest all-cause mortalities of the cholesterol of 225. Uh, as your cholesterol becomes lower than 225, you have higher rates, you have lower rates of uh, heart disease and stroke, but higher rates of mental health problems, higher rates of infections, higher rates of cancers, higher rates of suicide, higher rates of uh, homicide and rage. As your cholesterol is higher than 225, you have higher rates of um, heart disease and higher rates of cerebral vascular disease. So as I talk to my patients about their cholesterol, I'm wanting to understand what are their comorbid problems in terms of infections, uh, mental health issues, cancer risk, uh, cardiovascular risk, and uh, cerebral vascular risk. And then we have a discussion as to what would be a, a more optimal cholesterol for them. And then uh, eggs. Eggs are a superfood unless you have a food sensitivity to them. And they're the third most common food sensitivity in North America. Uh, and again, if you eat eggs regularly, you probably you have no idea if eggs are a food sensitivity issue. So 
in my clinical practice and in my clinical trials, we have people remove the eggs for at least three months and then retest to see if they'll tolerate the eggs and what kind of symptoms they have when they reintroduce the eggs. And if you have no symptoms, uh, eggs are a superfood, particularly the yolks. And is that the best way to discover what sensitivities we have, Dr. Walls, is doing an elimination well, diet for that period that, of time? Um, so you can do an elimination diet. You could do food, you could do lab testing. Um, my preference. Oh, Dr. Walls, we seem to have lost your audio for some reason. Okay, is that better? There we are. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So my preference is to do the elimination diet and then reintroduce things one at a time. Uh, a, another strategy is to do a, a more comprehensive food testing. The, the challenge there is that you can spend thousands of dollars to get a very detailed food sensitivity testing that can be confusing to interpret. You'll need to have a clinician who uh, orders these tests to guide how you uh, interpret uh, and remove foods, then reintroduce them. And, and furthermore, the, your, the clinical response in you will always trump the laboratory test, which is part of the reason why I prefer an elimination diet and then to reintroduce uh, compounds one at a time. Makes sense. All right, our next question is, and I'm gonna combine two here because they're both, uh, the three actually, about supplements. You mentioned supplements in your presentation. So we have three questions. Um, I'm gonna kind of put them all together. What are targeted supplements and um, what vitamins do you take, they're asking. Well, so targeted supplements, um, I, I'm thinking about things like um, the person's underlying medical symptoms, um, their underlying comorbid diagnoses, uh, and then I, I can um, make some recommendations based on their current symptoms and their comorbid diagnoses. Things that I think most people with MS, I, I would like them to monitor and, and think about, your vitamin D level. Um, our ancestors were outside 24 seven. We got deep dark tans during the summer. We'd gradually get white during the winter. And so we'd have a great vitamin D level all summer long. It would gradually fall during the winter. And then we'd start, you know, the sun came back in March. We'd start, you know, replenishing our vitamin D because the sun begins the making vitamin D when the sunlight hits our skin. So knowing your vitamin D level with the goal of getting your vitamin D to the top half of the reference range is something I want, I, I recommend for everyone. And because as our vitamin D level goes up, we will absorb more calcium out of our diet into our bloodstream. And we'll take that calcium and put it into our heart valves and our blood vessels instead of our teeth and our bones if we don't have enough vitamin K, vitamin uh, and vitamin A. So I want everyone to have both vitamin, vitamin D in the top half of the reference range and plenty of vitamin K. So I prefer to take a vitamin D plus vitamin K supplement. And then I monitor my vitamin D levels to be sure that my vitamin D is in the target range. And I'm looking again for the top half, preferably the top quartile, uh, because your risk of relapse and of progression is dramatically lower if your vitamin D is in that top half of the reference range. Uh, the next thing that I'm thinking about are my uh, B vitamin levels. Um, many of us, uh, and there's more evidence that if your homocysteine is high, uh, that's a measure of, of uh, the methylation capacity, how my body uses the B vitamin pathways. Am I efficient? Am I inefficient? If my homocysteine is high, I'm more likely to have neurodegeneration, that is a shrinking brain, shrinking a spinal cord. I'm at much greater risk for anxiety, depression, uh, and cognitive decline. So in my clinical practice, I measure the homocysteine. And I, if the homocysteine is above seven, I'm giving people methyl B12, methylfolate. Uh, and I'm also recommending my patients who have an anxiety, uh, depression, so any kind of mental health problem, 
or any kind of neurologic problem that they take a B vitamin that has what we call uh, our activated Bs. All, all of the B vitamins, when we get them from natural sources, so um, uh, organ meats, uh, liver, great source of the B vitamins, greens, great source of the B vitamins, but not B12. Um, they're in the natural form. If I get them from a synthetic uh, multivite, they are cheap synthetic forms that are similar to the naturally occurring vitamins. They're cheaper to make, but they aren't quite as effective in our cells. And we have to activate them so they will do the job that they're supposed to do. If you take um, a already activated form, uh, that's what's called the uh, activated B vitamins, uh, then you've uh, overcome that step. Um, uh, having liver once a week, very helpful. Having lots of greens, very helpful. That will get you more of those uh, B vitamins. Um, now, the, the third supplement that I uh, uh, think probably many of the listeners are thinking about, and that's the omega-3, the omega-6 fats. These are the fats that we don't have the enzymes to make the double bond at the three position and the sixth position, we don't have the enzymes to make. And those fats are really important to the cell membranes to making myelin. We have to eat them. The omega-6 fats are in nuts and seeds, uh, um, avocados, um, um, uh, flax, hemp, uh, walnut oil would have omega-6 fats. The omega-3 fats are in wild fish, grass-fed meat, and to some degree, um, uh, flax, hemp, uh, and walnuts. The vegetarian sources of the omega-3s, our cells, we have to add two more carbons to make the uh, EPA, DHA, uh, forms the omega-3s that our brain uh, uh, and our myelin use. And we're not very efficient at that. So I, I would, rather people take a couple grams of a fish oil uh, so that we know they have enough EPA and DHA. If you rely entirely on the vegetarian source, you have to have 20 times the amount because we're so inefficient at converting the omega, the vegetarian omega-3s to the longer EPA DHA version. And then, you know, I may do some additional supplements based again on comorbid problems. Uh, I may do sulfur amino acids, um, things like uh, um, N-acetylcysteine, taurine, uh, uh, lipoic acid. Uh, I may do uh, uh, turmeric, uh, I, I may do diindolmethane. Again, now this depends on the person's uh, comorbid problems and their clinical symptoms. So I, I, I'll say, I take a lot. I take quite a few supplements. Uh, it, when I first began my journey, I went vegetarian to paleo, still went downhill, added supplements, slowed my decline. Very helpful, I could tell. If I didn't take my supplements, my fatigue was much worse. When I redesigned my paleo diet to get the things I was taking in supplement form from the food, that's when the magic happened. And you know, like, oh my God, you know, suddenly I, I'm getting remarkably stronger. Although it's interesting that I still find if I'm not taking all of my supplements, I can tell that my energy, my mental clarity is not quite as sharp. Uh, and, and so the reality is I dug myself a really deep hole. Uh, you know, when I was in the totally reclined wheelchair and I couldn't sit up, I was reading that brain fog. I was having incredible levels of pain. So I'm remarkably better. I can jog around the neighborhood. I conduct research. I, so I do amazing stuff. But I can still tell that I feel better if I also take my supplements. And if I stop my diet, my pain turns on. You know, if, if, I, if I came to your house and had gluten, dairy, or eggs, in six to eight hours, I'd have incapacitating levels of pain. Fascinating. Now I'm going to stay with supplements with our last question on supplements for this segment. Um, who should give direction on the correct supplements a person should be taking? Sounds like you do a lot in your clinical practice. Yeah, what do you yeah. recommend? So, so, you know, in my book, um, I have a really lovely chapter on supplements and I walk people through uh, the supplements that, um, that I think about 
in the process that I go through as I'm talking to my patients to sort out what symptoms they have, what family history, and what to think about. But I still want them, want you to talk to your personal physician and say, okay, here's what I'm thinking, um, and get your physician's uh, take on this. I think monitoring your vitamin D, your homocysteine, uh, and your lipids is a great start for everyone. Uh, uh, and so in that big category, vitamin D, activated B vitamins, fish oil, great, great start. And this more nuanced as a conversation to have. And ideally, if you find someone who has a integrated practice or a naturopathic physician, uh, they uh, should be feel very comfortable talking with you and having a deeper conversation. You cannot supplement your way out of a terrible diet. You cannot supplement your way out of uh, a poor um, lifestyle routine. It can be helpful. And if, and if money is limited, spend your money on food. Spend your money on getting the best food you can. Yeah, really, really good advice, both of those. All right, we are um, eating away in our time here, but I'd like to move now. We have a couple of questions on specifically your journey, if you would share with us. Mm -hmm. People are wondering, how have your brain and spine lesions responded to this diet? You know, this is a great conversation. So I, I want to take you guys back to where I was in 2007. Could not sit up, being at brain fog, uh, tried general neurology, turned frequently on, very difficult to turn off. I would take five days of salumedrol and daily visits to the pain clinic to get it turned off. Terrible future. Uh, um, facing becoming bedridden, demented, and probably dying with intractable pain. That's where I was at in December. In April, I, come, I, I call my neurologist and say, there's been a change. I think I should see you. They want to see me that day. I said, no, how about Friday? So they're quite distressed. I put them off for uh, two days. And so I go to see my neurologist on Friday. I'm in the waiting room. Their nurse is trying, looking around. They can't see anyone. And I finally realized, oh, I bet she's looking for me. I'm not in my wheelchair. So I stand up. I'm waving my arm. She goes, oh, my God, Dr. Walls, where's your wheelchair? And I walk over. And so my neurologist is, is thrilled. He can't wait to get the MRI. He wants to order it emergently that day. And I convinced him, like, well, no, you know, might as well wait for the next available. So we have to wait a couple of weeks. We get the scan. And he and I go down to look at the scan, and it has not changed. And then he goes, you know, of course it's not changing. You have progressive MS. You're not having acute lesions. These are old scars. Of course they're not going to change. But you have rewired your brain. You clearly have rewired your brain, your spinal cord. Uh, and now what is interesting, you know, time has, has passed. I've continued to improve. You know, I'm now jogging in the neighborhood. Uh, and now my last uh, MRI, my neurologist says, you know, those spinal cord lesions that I said were never gonna uh, improve, you know, they really are remarkably smaller. So you are healing uh, the trouble. I, I think, the my neurologist is very clear that clinical exam trumps the MRI findings. If you are improving, that's really very helpful. Now, if you've discovered that you have 20 new lesions, even if you're clinically improving, you have 20 new lesions, that's definitely a problem. And we would want to be doing something differently. If you're in my clinical practice, I'd be talking to you about, yes, you should probably be doing DMTs. We need to do a better job on your diet and your self-care. And so new lesions are a big signal I don't want to ignore. But if you are dramatically improving clinically, and if you still have some, a few lesions, I don't want you to be too discouraged. It's your clinical improvement that is the most powerful. Excellent, excellent advice and a wonderful presentation. We are out of time. It's the end of our time for questions. 
We did, I'm just scanning through them here. Again, specific questions to your specific situation we're not going to address in this sort of a forum. And we really encourage you to contact your own medical team. Um, Dr. Walls, you are fascinating and so inspiring. And thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, the links to Dr. Walls' work will be included in the follow-up email that you'll all be getting today. So you can um, stay connected on Online or however you wish to. And again, Dr. Wall's two books are available wherever you find cookbooks and online, of course. Dr. Walls, we want to thank you so much for your time today and for your perspective and being here with us. Uh, that is excellent. Uh, and perhaps I'll see some of you at the Remyelination Workshop tomorrow. Excellent. Thanks again. Now I'm going to um, wrap up today with a bit of information from the MS Society of Canada. We want to again remind you about our MS Knowledge Network. It's staffed by trained navigators who provide consistent quality information. You can connect to them by phone, email, or live chat through the MS Society's website. Know that all your interactions and information is trustworthy from this source. Navigators can help you learn more about the MS Society programs and resources we offer to help individuals and their families in your MS journey. You, you can, they can also help you find other community or government supports and programs and so much more. For information and support, always reach out to our MS Knowledge Network. Now, if you'd like to sign up for the monthly e-newsletter, an MS Navigator can help you do that too. And when you receive the e-news, you're kept up to date on the latest MS research and treatments, the Society's programs and services, fundraising and volunteer opportunities. It's got everything in there, including inspirational stories, much like we've heard today from Dr. Walls, from people affected by MS and so much more. So you can get that directly delivered to your inbox every month. We also encourage you to be a part of the MS community, to get involved with our programs and services and events, government relations and volunteer opportunities. <clears throat> Volunteers are an essential part of the support we offer to Canadians affected by MS and the demand for assistance through our one-to-one -one peer support program and peer support groups is growing and we need more volunteers to reach as many people affected by MS as possible. If you'd like more information or you're interested in getting involved, please reach out. <clears throat> if you have questions or need support, for this webinar or any of our educational activities, again, you can reach out. We've got a new email um, that should be up on the screen there now. It's education at mssociety.ca. And again, you can find that through our website, which is, of course, mssociety.ca. Now, very soon, you'll receive an email about today's webinar, and we encourage you to please fill it out. For the Facebook Live audience, the link to the survey is already available in the chat. We ask that all viewers complete this survey. The information from, collected from the evaluation will let us know if today's discussion was valuable to you and what topics you'd like to see covered in the future. It'll only take a couple of minutes and your feedback will go a long way to help us when planning these future educational sessions. So on behalf of the MS Society of Canada, again, we send a big thank you to Roche Canada for providing sponsorship for today's broadcast. A huge thank you to Dr. Walls for being our expert today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. Thanks so much for being here. Take care. Bye-bye.